Good morning, Professor Descola. <laughs> nice to see you again. <laughs> and good morning, everyone. Um, it is our honor to have Professor Descola this year here for the Li Yuan Memorial Lectureship. Uh, Professor Li Yuan was one of the founding fathers of uh, Taiwan anthropology and of the uh, establishment of this institution. He passed away in the spring of 2017, and this Institute uh, of Ethnology set up this Li Yuan Memorial Lectureship to thank him, uh, to, to, thank, uh, to commemorate the contribution of Professor Li made to this Institute and to the anthropology in Taiwan, and this is the sixth year. Before this year, we have Professor Sang Green and Stephen Sangreen, Robert Weller, and Komarov, all of them are prestigious uh, scholars in the world. And um, I will give a brief introduction of uh, Professor Descola. Uh, Descola is Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at the College of France and Director of Study at the EHESS Paris a major figure in European anthropology. He initially specialized in the ethnology of Amazonia, focusing on the relations of native society with non-human. Besides his field research with the Atrua of Ecuador, which uh, was published uh, as in the Society of Nature, a native ecology in Amazonia in 1986, he has published extensively on the comparative approach of the relations between humans and non-humans, such as books uh, Beyond Nature and Culture in 2013, translated in English, The Ecology of Others, The Composition of Worlds, and recently, he also published a book on the nature and function of image. Uh, he has written or edited over 20 books, translated in a dozen languages, and has been a visiting scholar professor in a number of prestigious institutions worldwide. Recipient in 2012 of the CNRS Gold Medal and the highest scientific distinction in France. Professor Descola also is a foreign member of the British Academy and of the American Academy of Art and Science. And today his talk is Varieties of Animism in Amazonia and Southeast Asia. But for the past two weeks, um, I thank Beaton uh, with uh, go with uh, Professor Tesla to the Tefu year of the um, Zhou, Zhou, Zhou tribes and Matan for the Amis uh, tribes. So uh, Professor Professor Tesla also might be and uh, include the uh, tribe minority in Taiwan in your future framework. <laughs> And today, I think I will ask Bizen to chair the Q and A after your speech. So let's welcome Professor Tesla. I am most grateful to uh, Okay, thank you. I'm most grateful to the... Uh... Is it all right? Thank you. Not quite.
Is it better? Yes. <laughs> As I was saying, I'm most grateful to the uh, Institute of Ethnology of the Academia Sinica and uh, Director uh, Professor Chang Shun for inviting me to deliver the uh, Li Yi Wan uh, Memorial Lecture. Uh, my warmest thanks also go to uh, Pi Chen Liu, uh, my friend and colleague whom I met many years ago in Paris as a doctoral student uh, for uh, organizing this uh, series of activities in uh, Taiwan and in particular this uh, lecture today at the Academia uh, Sinica. My uh, long-standing interest as an anthropologist, that of understanding the different ways according to which life processes can be conceptualized, was triggered many years ago when I was studying what I called at the time the socialization of nature by members of a recently contacted Amerindian tribe uh, in the upper Amazon. I discovered during this immersion of three years among the Achuar people with my wife and fellow anthropologist Anne Christine Taylor that what I believed initially to be a universal feature of the perception of the world, the tendency to classify beings and phenomena, whether as social kind or as natural kind, was in fact totally irrelevant for the people with whom I was living. For them, animals, plants, even certain artifacts, were endowed with a soul which converted these entities into persons with a full-fledged social and cultural life, persons with whom communication in dreams and through magical songs was reputedly possible. As a consequence, the distinction that we Westerners usually make between nature and society was for them quite meaningless. For the past 50 years, I've been trying to explore the consequences of this discovery. Historically, by trying to show that the great divide between nature and culture is not a cognitive universal, but a recent and contingent tool crafted in the West in the course of the past centuries. Ethnographically, by examining the great variety of ways according to which humans establish continuities and discontinuities between humans and non-humans. And anthropologically, by trying to find a more encompassing and less culture-specific theoretical framework, which would accommodate this variety within a single analytical model. By contrast with some colleagues in the social sciences who are also critical of the dualism of nature and society, I strongly believe that trying to eliminate the duality between the subject and the world in the description and analysis of collective life must not lead to discarding the quest for framing devices that could account for the coherence and regularity of the behavior of the members of a community, of the distinctive styles of their actions, and of the codified expressions that they give of these actions. In other words, it is not enough to show that the opposition between the universality of natural laws and the randomness of cultural diversity is meaningless for many societies, it is also necessary to integrate this distinction in a new analytical framework where, far from constituting the template that would allow anthropologists to gouge distant, distant cultures, it would be nothing more than one of the possible expressions of more general schemas structuring 
the objectivation of things in the world. I've presented at length such a general theory of the forms of experience in a book, Beyond Nature and Culture, published uh, in English in 2013 and a few years before in French in 2005. What I intend to do in this lecture is to sum up the general argument of the book and to examine the relevance of my propositions when applied to Southeast Asian ethnographic material. Before I begin, however, I would like to say a few words about the very nature of my endeavor. Simply put, my purpose uh, is to bring to light structural regularities in the ways the phenomenological world is instituted and to show their compatibilities and incompatibilities. However, any analysis that purports to reveal structural regularities comes with a cost, and that cost is usually the lack of plausible connections between, on the one hand, the ad hoc models built by an observer in order to describe the properties of the social systems he or she studies, and on the other hand, the cognitive and practical mediations, thanks to which the structural patterns thus isolated by the analyst could eventually come to regulate or to orient the behavior of the individuals of the society under analysis. This is a criticism that has often been addressed to structural anthropology, and rightly so. Now, recent research in cognitive psychology on the theory of schemas may provide a mean to account for the way in which models of relations and behavior could structure actual practice without being consciously apprehended, that is, without appearing to individuals as repertories of propositional norms. Schemas are abstract structures, such as the artificial perspective of the routine scenarios of daily interaction, which organize skills, perceptions, and action without mobilizing a declarative knowledge. They are mental, sensory motor, and emotional dispositions that are embodied thanks to the experience acquired in a social milieu. They are, to borrow uh, Maurice Bloch's words, I quote him, things that go without saying. Some of, th some of them, which I call uh, integrative schemas, are particularly interesting for anthropologists, for they could provide us with the type of mediating function which gives us the sense of sharing with other individuals the combination of habits that we usually call culture. They can be defined as cognitive structures which generate inferences endowed with a high degree of abstraction that are capable of ensuring the compatibility between family, families of specialized schemas, as well as gener generating new ones by induction. Structural analysis, as I see it, gives access to an understanding of how people schematize their experience and of how this process provides them with the explicit system of codification to which they adhere. And the guarantee that the formal model constructed by the analyst does reveal some features of the social system that he or she studies would therefore accrue from the fact that these features are not derived from some universal properties of the human mind, except perhaps at a very general level, but are rather expressions 
of the frames and devices through which the actors themselves tacitly objectify their relations to the world. However, this objectivation is not done at random. In order to understand how it may work, my point of departure is a thought experiment based on a simple intuition that I borrow from the philosopher Edmund Husserl. That is the idea that we humans are equipped to deal with the world with two basic assets, a body and an intentionality. This equipment allows us to generate a specific kind of integrative schema, which I call an identification, that is the elementary mechanism by the means of which I recognize differences and similarities between I and the objects in the world by inferring analogies and distinctions of appearances, behavior, and attributes between what I think I am and what I think the others are. In other words, I can attribute or deny to an as yet indeterminate alter an interiority and a physicality analogous to the ones I believe I am endowed with. Interiority is taken here in a deliberately vague sense that according to the context will refer to the attributes ordinarily associated to the soul, to the mind, or to consciousness, intentionality, subjectivity, reflexivity, the aptitude to dream or to signify, or to more abstract characteristics, such, such as the idea that I share with an alter the same essence or origin, or that we belong to the same ontological category. Physicality, by contrast, refers to form, substance, physiological, perceptual, sensory motor, and proprioceptive processes, or even to temperament as an expression of the purported influence of bodily humors. The identifications based on the combination of interiority and physicality are in fact very limited. When confronted with an alter, whether human or non-human, I can either surmise that this object possesses elements of materiality and interiority analogous to mine, and this I call totemism, or that his interiority and his physicality are entirely distinct from mine, and this I call analogism, or that we have similar interiorities and different materialities, and this I call animism, or that our interiorities are discontinuous and our materialities continuous, and this I call naturalism. These formulae define four major types of ontologies, that is, of systems of detection of qualities among existence, which in turn provide anchoring points for sociocosmic forms of aggregation, conceptions of alterity, and definition, definitions of the epistemic subject. Let us briefly examine some properties of these four modes of identification. Animism as a continuity of souls and a discontinuity of bodies is quite common in South and North America, among native cultures, of course, in Siberia, and in some parts of Southeast Asia, where peoples endow plants, animals, and other elements 
of the environment, including non-visible elements such as spirits or deities, with a subjective self and uh, establish with these entities all sorts of personal relations. In animist systems, humans and non-humans are conceived as possessing the same type of interiority. Most animals and some plants are treated as persons endowed with a soul which allows them to communicate with humans. And it is because of this common internal essence that non-humans are said to possess social characteristics, behavior based on the respect of kinship rules or ethical codes, ritual activity, etc. However, the reference shared by most beings in the world is mankind as a general condition, not man as a species. In other words, humans and all the kinds of non-humans with whom humans interact have each different physicalities in that their identical internal essences or selves are lodged in different types of bodies that are often described locally as clothing that can be done or discarded, the better to underline their autonomy from the interiorities which inhabit them. Now this specific clothing in use contrasted perspectives on the world in that the physiological and perceptual constraints proper to a type of body impose to each class of being a specific position and point of view in the general ecology of relations. Human and non-human persons have an integrally cultural view of their life sphere, to use our own uh, uh, words, because they share the same kind of interiority, but the world that all these entities apprehend and use is different for their bodily equipments are distinct. These differences of bodies bear on form rather than substance. This is hardly surprising as uh, animist ontologies borrow part of their operational schema from the model of the trophic chain. Everywhere in the animist archipelago, one finds the idea that vitality, energy, and fecundity constantly circulate between organism uh, thanks to the capture, the exchange, and the consuming of flesh. And this constant recycling of tissues and fluids at all levels, analogous to the one which characterizes nutritional interdependence, is a clear indication that all these beings that ingest one, one another cannot be distinguished by the substance they are made of. By contrast, the place that each species occupied in the trophic chain is precisely determined by its organic equipment, since it conditions both the milieu accessible to the species, water, land, air, etc., and through the organs of locomotion and acquisition of food, the type of resources that can be tapped in this milieu. The form of bodies is thus the entire biological toolkit that allows a species to occupy a habitat and to lead there the distinctive lifestyle through which it is identified. And although many species share certain interiority, each one of them thus possesses its own physicality under the guise of a particular ethogram, which will 
determine its own umwelt in the sense of Jacobon Uxkul, that is, the salient features of its environment are those that are geared to the, its specific bodily tools, mode of locomotion, of reproduction, of acquiring food, etc., etc. Let us now turn to the second mode of identification, where some beings in the world share sets of physical and moral attributes that, that seem to cut across the boundaries of species. I call it totemism, but in a very different sense from the one which has been attached to the term since uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss attempted to debunk what he called the totemic illusion by showing that totemism can be viewed as a general classificatory device using natural discontinuities as a mental model to organize social segmentation. This was the accepted meaning, which I used myself previously in a couple of papers, uh, where I tried mistakenly, as it were, to contrast animism and totemism by uh, stating that while uh, totemism uses natural discontinuities between natural species in order to map social relations between humans, animism uses social categories in order to map relations between humans and natural objects. However, these two neat inversion, in fact, ratified the distinction between nature and society, which is inherent to the levi straussian version of totemism. And thus, it does not render justice to animism where this distinction is meaningless. I now believe that this distinction is also meaningless in the case of totemism. For totemism is more than a universal classificatory device. It, is, it can be taken in that sense, yeah, but it is more than that. It is also, and perhaps foremost, a very original ontology which is best exemplified by Aboriginal Australia. There, the main totem of a group of humans, most often an animal or a plant, but 70% of the names of totems in Aboriginal Australia refer to animals. So the main totem of a group and all the beings, human and non-human, that are affiliated to it are said to share certain general attributes of physical conformation, substance, and behavior by virtue of a common origin localized in space. Now, as the linguist Karl Georg von Brandenstein has shown very clearly in his thorough analysis of the meaning of Australian totem terms, these attributes that cross-cut the species boundaries are not derived from what is improperly called the eponym entity, since the word designating the totem in many cases is not the name of a species, that is, it is not a biological taxon, but rather the name of an abstract property which is present in these species as well as, as well as in all the beings subsumed under it in a demic grouping. In other words, in other words, the names of the totemic classes are terms that denote properties which are also used to designate the totemic species and not the reverse, that is, not names of zoological taxa from which would be inferred the typical attributes of the totemic classes. It is thus difficult to maintain 
at least for Australia, the classificatory interpretation of totemism, since the basic difference here is between aggregates of attributes that are common to humans and non-humans within classes designated by abstract terms and not between animals and vegetal species that would provide naturally by their manifest discontinuities of form and behavior an analogical template that could be used so as to structure social discontinuities. The third mode of identification, which I call analogism, is predicated on the idea that all the entities in the world are fragmented into a multiplicity of essences, forms, and substances separated by minute intervals, often ordered along a graded scale such as in the great chain of being, which served as the main cosmological model during the European Middle Ages and Renaissance. This disposition allows for a recombination of the system of initial contrasts into a dense network of analogies linking the intrinsic properties of each autonomous entity present in the world. What is most striking in such systems is the amount of ingenuousness with which all the similarities and resonances liable to provide a basis for inferences are actively sought for, especially as these apply uh, in crucial domains of life, such as the prediction and treatment of illness and misfortune. The obsession with analogies become a dominating feature as in traditional China, where according to Marcel Granet, I quote him, society, man, the world are objects of a global knowledge constituted by the sole use of analogy, hence my use of the word analogism to denote this mode of identification. However, analogy is only a result or a consequence of the necessity to organize a world composed of a multiplicity of independent elements, such as the Chinese Wangwu, the 10,000 essences or qualities. Analogies become possible and thinkable only if the terms that it conjoins are initially distinguished, if the power to detect similarities between things is applied to singularities that are by this process partially extracted from their original isolation. Thus, analogism can be seen as a sort of hermeneutic dream of completeness and totalization, which proceeds from a dissatisfaction at taking stock of the fact that all the components of the world are separated by tiny discontinuities. It entertains the hope of weaving these weakly differentiated elements in a canvas of affinities and attractions, which has all the appearances of continuity. But the ordinary state of the world is indeed a multiplicity of reverberating differences, and resemblance is only the expected means to render this fragmented world intelligible and tolerable. This multiplication of the elementary pieces of the world re reverberating within each of its parts, including humans, divided into numerous components, themselves divided in successive nestings 
and partially located outside of their bodies, appear, appears to be a distinctive feature of analogous ontologies and the best clue for identifying them. Apart from the case of China, to which I've already alluded, this type of ontology was dominant in Europe from antiquity to the Renaissance and is also quite common in some parts of Asia, in West Africa, and in native cultures of Mexico, Central America, and the Andes. The last mode of identification, naturalism, corresponds to an ontology which emerged in the West in propositional form during the 17th century, in images a few centuries before in the 15th century and which would best be described as a process, that of naturalization, a process which has been going on via the second colonial expansion and the globalization process in many other parts of the world. For naturalism is not only the idea that nature exists, that certain entities or their existence and development to a principle which is extraneous both to chance and to the effects of human will. Naturalism also implies a counterpart, a world of artifice and free will, the complexity of which has progressively emerged during under the scrutiny of analysts until it rendered necessary during the 19th century the institution of special sciences, so-called social sciences, which were given the task of stabilizing its boundaries and characteristics, that is, the diversity of expressions of the creativity of humans as producers of science, norms, and goods. Now, if one considers naturalism, that is the coexistence between a single unifying nature and a, and a multiplicity of cultures, not as the all embracing template, which allows objectifying any reality, but as one among several other modes of identification, then its contrastive properties appear much more clearly. For instance, naturalism inverts the ontological premises of animisms <coughs> since instead of claiming an identity of soul and a difference of bodies, it is predicated upon a discontinuity of interiorities and a material continuity. What <clears throat> distinguishes humans from non-humans in the naturalist ontology is the mind, the soul, <clears throat> subjectivity, a moral conscience, language, and so forth. In the same way as human groups are distinguished from one another, by a collective internal disposition that used to be called Volkgeist, but is more familiar to us now under its modern label of culture. On the other hand, we have been informed, especially since Darwin, that the physical dimension of humans locate them within a material continuum <clears throat> wherein they do not stand out as singularities. The ontological discrimination which excludes non-human organisms biologically very close to us, one could think of chimpanzees for instance, is a sign of the privilege granted in the naturalist mode of identification to criteria based on the uh, expression of a purported interiority, language, self-consciousness, you know, theory of mind, etc., 
rather than those based on material activity. I want to make clear that these four modes of identification are in no way exclusive. My hypothesis is that each human activates one or another of these modes of uh, identification in certain circumstances, but that one of them is always dominant in a specific time and place, in that it gives to members of a community who have been socialized according to the same patterns, the main framework through which they interpret and perceive salient aspects of their environment. Although ontologies encountered in some parts of the world evidence one or another mode of identification in a very pure and clear form in Amazonia, in Australia, in China, for instance, perhaps the most common situation is one of hybridity in the sense of a combination of sets of specific features pertaining to different modes of identification. This typology of models should thus be taken as a heuristic device rather than as a method for classifying societies into rigid compartments. However, hybridity does not mean here as it often does nowadays, a random mixture of elements resulting from historical vagaries, for most societies in that sense would be hybrids resulting from a merger of inner processes and contradictory external influences. Hybridity means a state of equilibrium in a logical process of structural transformation from one of the four modes of identification to another, where some elements of the core ontology are still present and cohabit with elements of another core ontology without the latter one predominating over the former. In my book, Beyond Nature and Culture, I have attempted to show how such a structural transformation would work by examining the ontological transformations required to pass from an egalitarian relationship between humans and non-humans to a hierarchical one as one moves westward from the hunting societies of northern North America to the nomadic herders of southern Mongolia through a series of intermediate steps. To explain this structural dynamic, I must return briefly to another proposition that I made in my book Beyond Nature and Culture to account for social and cultural diversification. The four ontological archipelagos are not uniform. They become internally differentiated by various pat elementary patterns of relation that shape interactions between humans and non-humans alike. These relations can be divided into three, into two main groups. On the one hand, exchange, predation, and gift, wherein the value moves between potentially reversible terms that have an equivalent ontological status. On the other hand, production, protection, and transmission, wherein the relation is oriented between hierarchical terms. Although this set of relations can be said to form the basic toolkit of the social sciences, I've reworked them slightly. For instance, by contrast with the position of Marcel Mauss, gift for me is differentiated from exchange as the latter operation exchange 
always calls for a double movement of give and take, while the first gift excludes by principle a counterpart, otherwise it would not be a gift. Similarly, production is in no way the universal process it passes for in Marxist and constructivist approaches. For the idea of an international agent imposing a form on matter according to a mental blueprint is a conception of action that is uncommon in most non-European cultures. So these patterns of relations are partly based on cognitive processes, but they are not inbuilt categorical imperatives. Rather, they should be treated as objectified properties of collective life, which come to be embodied in physical and mental dispositions and are thus stabilized as habitus. Giving, including oneself, to others, taking or receiving from them, exchanging with them, but also appropriating others, protecting them, producing them, or placing oneself in the dependence. These form the basic set of interpersonal actions that humans have inherited from their phylogeny. And it should come as no surprise that they provide a repertory from which each collective will draw a favorite mode of relating to others. My argument is that the main condition for change, that is, for the transformation of specific combinations of ontological types and patterns of relations, resides in the substitution of a dominant scheme of relation by another. For if the same ontology can be modulated by very dissimilar relational configurations, this tolerance does not extend beyond a certain point. Certain patterns of relation that play a minor part in a given ontological context may see their role increase for a variety of reasons in such a way that they end up becoming incompatible with the dominant ontological distribution. As a result, the latter may evolve towards a new ontological scheme that will prove more hospitable to the new hegemonic relation. As I said a moment ago, I have attempted to illustrate such a process in Beyond Nature and Culture by showing how a relation of protection evolves as it passes from a marginal position within the context of giving animism typical of native uh, North, uh, Northern North America, that is the protection afforded to his herd by the spirit master of the caribous to a dominant position in the context of the protective analogism typical of the herders of Southern Siberia, that is the protection afforded by humans to their cattle, by the divinities to humans and their animals, by the ancestors to their descendants, etc. Through a series of intermediate positions in Eastern and Northern Siberia. So although animal domestication seems to play a central role in this transition process, the actualization of this technique is in no way automatic. Domestication was potentially present in native northern North America, but symbolically, if you wish, through the pattern of relationship implied between the spirit master of animals and the herds of caribous. But it was never actualized in practice. And it was even actively resisted against 
because its result, a new status for certain animals, did not fit the local ontology. It seems to me that a similar line of analysis could be applied to Southeast Asian ethnographic material. In a book uh, published in uh, 2016 by Rutledge, Animism in Southeast Asia, partly devoted to discussing the applicability of my propositions to the region, the editors, the intellectual editors, Kai Urem and Guido uh, Springer, argue that Southeast Asia challenges my typology, notably because most indigenous cosmologies there share some features with both animism and as analogism as I define them, while differing from both in other respects. In his uh, introduction to the volume, Kai Urem, who uh, I may add is, is a, a former Amazonianist, worked in uh, Northwest Amazonia, so he's familiar with both uh, cultural domains. Uh, Kai Urem argues in particular that the institutions in Southeast Asia have a distinctive analogous flavor, ancestor worship, sacrifice, spirit possession, a formal priesthood, while the basic features of an analogous ontology, such as a highly segmented and diversified world, a fragmented and unstable subject, are generally lacking, except for one feature, which is, in my view, the most important hierarchy. Hierarchy, which is the standard feature of analogism, is also very present in uh, uh, Southeast Asia. This is why Kai Aram proposes to qualify Southeast Asian animism as mostly hierarchical by contrast with other forms of animism encountered in the Americas, in Northern Northeast Asia, and also exceptionally in Southeast Asia, such as among the Shewong, for instance, of Malaysia, which are all markedly egalitarian. An analogist ontology, properly speaking, according to him, would be also uncommon, corresponding to pre-modern state formations such as the uh, Shan microstates of the Javanese uh, kingdom. So if I understand Kai Aram uh, correctly then, what he proposes for Southeast Asia is a sort of graded ontological continuum from egalitarian animism to straightforward analogism with a central core of hierarchical animism, which he calls the cosmological prototype. The pole of egalitarian animism would be well represented by the Shewong of Malaysia, which I mentioned a few moments ago, which indeed played a role, the major part in my own definition of animism initially, to which should be added other Orangasli group, uh, groups in Malaysia, in particular the Ma Betisek and the Batek, while the most hierarchical forms of animism, such as the Toraja and Bugis polities in Sulawesi, would verge on analogism. I have nothing against this graded model, which closely resembles structurally at least the Northwestern America to Southern Mongolia group of transformation, which I put forth in Beyond Asia and Culture. With the, the difference that regarding Southeast Asia, the continuum is not made up of a contiguous series of transformation extending over space, but rather of an encapsulation 
of different ontological regimes often coexisting in the same geographical space and even in some cases of a regular oscillation of the same polity between the egalitarian and the hierarchical pose of animism as with the notorious Gumsa Gumlao contrast uh, emphasized by Edmund Leach among the Kachin. Thus, the problem is not so much to account for how one moves from the most hierarchical forms of animism to straightforward analogism, but rather to account for how one moves from egalitarian to hierarchical animism and to understand whether these two forms of animism represent variations within a single ontological complex or are already uh, symptoms of an ontological shift. I will examine the second part of the question first to, so as to better identify the main features of what Kai Adam alternatively calls hierarchical animism or the Hill tribe cosmology. These are very easy to sum up. The feature common to all forms of animism, which is universal interiority, is in the case of hierarchical animism graded along a vertical uh, scale, the upper layers of which are peopled by powerful spirits and often topped by a supreme, a supreme uh, spirit rather than segmented along a horizontal plane, as is the case, for instance, in, uh, in uh, Amazonia. In standard animism, in Amazonia, for instance, beings are integrated by a principle of symmetrical intersubjectivity between ontologically equivalent beings, and they are differentiated along the axis of physicality, not of interiority. They all have the same kind of soul, but lodged in different kinds of bodies. In Southeast Asian animism, beings have also different kinds of bodies, but by contrast with the previous type of animism, they also have graded souls. That is, souls that are differentiated along a vertical scale. And this is because, as Thomas Kirsch has shown in his book, Feasting and Social Association, 1973, that hill tribe notions of potency, fertility, fecundity, not only can be interpreted according to a standard animist regime as taking the form of an individual soul, that is, as a disposition intrinsic to a human or non-human being, albeit, albeit differentiated along a graded scale of potency. It can be also seen as a capacity originating from outside the being associated with it, that is, acquired from an external source and often taking the form of a personal quality embodied in a spirit, just such as uh, a personal quality such as cunning, luck, ambition, courage, uh, wealth, etc. Now, both as an aspect of soul and as a capacity deriving from an external source, interiority tends to be reified as something detachable from the subject, a, a substantive quality that becomes more physical, visible and is thus liable to be differentiated along a graded scale of power. And that is a great distinction with the soul, the Amazonian souls, I, 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 could, I could say. The second uh, major feature of Southeast Asian animism 
namely sacrifice, appears to me as a mere consequence of the former for reasons that I will state further, it is a very efficient mechanism for articulating the various layers of graded inter uh, subjectivities. A third feature, the fact that the exchange of perspectives, what Eduardo Viveros de Castro calls perspectivism, does not occur between humans and animals, as is the case in Amazonia and in Northern North America, uh, but between humans and spirits is noteworthy, but I find it circumstantial as it is found also in Mongolia. As such, it would provide an interesting aspect to add to an expanded ontological group of transformation ranging from American animism to Southeast Asian animism, where along the way, spirits with specific appearances have progressively uh, replaced spirits in animal forms. A last feature of Southeast Asian animism is that interiority is not only graded according to a theory of what uh, Thomas Kirsch calls uh, unequal souls. These souls can also be reified or outwardly expressed in wealth, rank, and worldly powers, thus broadcasting in a very visible way what are initially internal dispositions, whether innate or acquired. Now, it seems to me that all these features have a close connection to animal domestication. In egalitarian animism, humans take animal lives through hunting, while the, the spirits of animals take human lives in return. It's a sort of nearly-willy exchange as human illness and death are ultimately a form of counterpredation exerted by game animals and their master spirits. Shamanism in Amazonia is entirely devoted to trying to counteract this uh, uh, counter uh, uh, predation exerted by animals. Uh, but it's the same also uh, up, up north and among the Inuit. There's a, there's a, a fine saying by a, an Inuit shaman who was the main informant of Rasmussen by the name of Ival Wadruk, who said to Rasmussen, uh, the, the great period of humankind is that our uh, uh, food is almost entirely made of souls. And of course, this is the predicament of humans. They have to consume souls and consuming souls renders one very ill. And so shamans are there to uh, try to correct and redress this situation. By contrast, by contrast, in Southeast Asian animism, spirits who attempt to take human lives receive instead the lives of domestic animals offered in sacrifice. And this is possible because, as I've attempted to show in Beyond Nature and Culture, sacrificial animals share many characteristics of humans and can thus replace them in the confrontation with spirits. They are sort of uh, neo-humans. What mainly differs between standard animism and Southeast Asian animism is thus the status of animals. In the former case, in standard animism or egalitarian animism, if you wish, or South American animism, uh, the game animal is an alter ego to uh, humans, but also the absolute embodiment of alterity, out of which humans 
uh, derive their contrastive identity. And this is why human domestication is inconceivable in standard animism. And Ernerdorf, uh, in the in the whole of the Americas, both South and Northern North America. Um, but when a relation of protection is extended by humans over animals, as is the case with domestication, the animals can become substitutes for humans in sacrifice and the exchange of lives against life, which is characteristic of Amerindian animism, transforms into a mediated exchange where the occupants of the middle layer exchange with the occupant of the upper layer who control them, the lives of the occupants of the lower, of the lower layer whom they control in order to ensure their own welfare. So the cascading relation, relations of protection and dependency implied everywhere by animal domestication are thus the basis for an extension of animism towards a graded continuum of life-giving and life-taking, which, however, does not jeopardize the system of generalized intersubjectivity upon which it is predicated. So the passage from hierarchical animism to analogism proper requires not so much a furthering of the hierarchical pattern as an accentuation of the ontological distinction between the various layers of the hierarchy, both in terms of interiority and of physicality an amplification of the system of unequal souls, to borrow uh, Thomas Kirch's words, which end up, ends up in the analogist hyper-fragmented subject, is rendered possible by the fact that the typical Southeast Asian personhood, both human and non-human, is multifaceted because different aspects of it are actualized according to what they relate to. So there's not a single uh, uh, subjective person, but there are different subjective persons according to the kind of relation they entertain with other subjects. Whence derives not only the idea of graded souls, where entities exhibit varying degrees of agency and boundedness, but also the idea that internal differentiation will stem from the very nature of the entities with which aspect of the soul will deal with, ending, ending up in the multiply and unstable self typical of analogist ontologies. As for the difference in physicality, which are already one of the two defining features of standard animism and the uh, basis for the existence of the various human and non-human tribe species, they become amplified when different tribe species with different types of bodily dispositions become integrated within a single collective, which is something unheard of, of course, in uh, classical animism, especially in South America. And the best solution for such a combination is to grade the tribe species along a hierarchical scale analogous to the Hindu caste system, as the Toraja and Bogis have done with their own stratified social organization where each caste is seen as a different natural kind. Well, here are some thoughts I wanted to share with you on the question of ontological regimes in Southeast Asia, leading your indulgence for the gross oversimplifications I've probably committed. 
and in the hope that your remarks and your questions may enable me to clarify my ideas, redress my mistakes, and perhaps refine my general propositions. Thank you. And now we have 40 minutes for questions. Now we open the questions. You can ask questions in English, French, or uh, Mandarin, even in Spanish if you want, as you want. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, 请问可以问一个问题吗? Okay, Paul, from Institute of Sociology. Bonjour, c'est Paul, on s'est vu. <laughs> Wait, wait. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think this the lecture is, is uh, very rich and dense and a little bit difficult. I'm looking forward to the publication of this lecture so I can read it again and <laughs> and go into the details. I am very curious about uh, if you could uh, explain a few words of your exper experience with the ZOO and uh, where you've been with Bijan. And how this experience resonates with uh, what you have seen in Amazonia and what you've read from Southeast Asian anthropologies. Thank you. Well, it's only a very short experience, uh, but thanks to the uh, presence and uh, uh, explanations of uh, Pichin. I was uh, able to grasp a little bit what was going on. What I uh, uh, what struck me was precisely uh, 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 by contrast with uh, the, I'll, I'll speak first of the contrast now with uh, uh, South American animism was the greatness uh, of things, in particular uh, the omnipresence of ancestors uh the uh, the time depth of the ancestors uh, someone uh, um who said uh, he was able to uh, recount the name of uh, her ancestors because it was a, a woman in a matrilineal society uh, for uh, 50 generations which of course uh, struck me as among the Achwa where I did my fieldwork some people do not remember the name of their grandparents no uh, so uh, the, the 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 importance of 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 descent and uh, of the accumulation uh, of uh, prerogatives and uh, and 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 aptitudes that are inherited uh, uh, <coughs> it, 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 is part of the gradedness that I mentioned in uh, this uh, lecture. At the same time, um, the capacity to uh, uh, interact in different contexts with uh, the, among the soul in particular, with the spirit of the land, uh, the uh, spirit of the hunt, uh, the spirit of the, of the millet, etc. Uh, is very much uh, uh, evocative of the interpersonal relationship that is obvious in animism in other parts of the world. No, so uh, uh, I think that my experience uh, with the Aboriginal people here uh, uh, confirm uh, the 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 uh, it seems to confirm at least. But I would have to read more extensively on them. Uh, to confirm their uh, belonging to uh, this general pattern of Southeast Asian animism, but with the specific characteristics that I mentioned of hierarchy and gradedness. And, uh, and although I would have to enter more into the ethnography to understand whether, for instance, there is 
a multifaceted soul as uh, uh, or, 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 or an equal soul, as uh, to to use uh, Thomas Kirch's uh, words, uh, or not. But uh, obviously, there is a continuity there. It would be interesting also to, um, since we are uh, here within a, a specific linguistic and in a way cultural uh, vast uh, system, which is the Austronesian uh, uh, tradition, uh, it would be interesting to see how uh, with the Austronesian ex expansion uh, in Polynesia, these things change because for me, Polynesia, especially the great polities like uh, Hawaii, are obviously uh, analogous in most respects. Uh, and uh, I, I, I became in, quite interested, for instance, in New Guinea, which is very interesting because New Guinea has features uh, which are in some cases analogous, in other cases, especially in the in the around the Mount Bozavi area, are completely and definitely uh, uh, standard animist, very much like in Amazonia, or in some cases there are elements of totemism. So this, the, the uh, New Guinea is an interesting group of transformation in that respect, in that uh, some of these aspects uh, 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 in in the island transform into each other to uh, uh, and result in different uh, uh, um, different forms of polities and uh, uh, and uh, ontological uh, 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 regimes. So that's what I uh, m my personal experience was first very pleasurable. Uh, it's not a substitute for intensive reading of the ethnography, which I uh, uh, which I enjoy also, <laughs> and which I regret not to have done beforehand, before coming <laughs> with uh, with uh, uh, Pichen to the so uh, <laughs> uh, as I did recently. <laughs> I, I have two questions. Uh, uh, first one is that uh, you, you introduced four uh, ontological conception years. Do you open to the fifth, sixth possibility of both as fifth, sixth, seventh? Do you, do you open this possibility? This is my first question. The second question would be like, uh, in terms of, for example, Marx's particular, commodity particular, how are you going to all, uh, analyze it with your conception to analyze commodity particular? Seems to me it's part of animism, part of um, totemism. And also, it could, it could be the phenomenon of naturalism. So I'm trying, I try to understand how you're going to use this concept to analyze it phenomenon of the commodity petition. I didn't get the, the, the second question, I'm sorry. Could you, could you... Ma Marx, Marx is a commodity, commodity, commodity petition. What, what kind of, what, how are you going to analyze this using the full conception you have? Because it seems to me that this concept is partially animism, partially, uh, totemism, also naturalism. So I'm trying to understand how you're going to assess this kind of phenomenon. That's my question. Thank you. Well, the 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 four uh, formulae are um, models. Uh, they are not uh, templates for empirical reality. Uh, they are models that are used to understand the conditions for. Uh, the the, the 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 building of different ways of life of worlding as 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 I use more and more the term uh, and the compatibilities and incompatibilities between some kinds of institutions that are present in uh, polities around the world uh, that could be explained by these models so they are uh, they, they are 
models that uh, try to, uh, that are helpful in the sense that they stipulate the conditions for certain phenomena, uh, but they are not descriptive typologies. So, uh, in, in, in that sense, um, I mentioned briefly the question of hybridity and the fact that many actual uh, uh, social uh, groups that we are uh, interested in as uh, social scientists are in fact hybrids. They are hybrids of different sorts. Some of them are historical hybrids because they have been uh, they have uh, um, undergone uh, the uh, influence of neighboring uh, societies or they have undergone the influence of domination by uh, uh, dominating uh, uh, polities, colonialism or other forms of that. Others are structural hybridity. These are quite interesting in the sense that they are common uh, in some parts of the world because of the overlapping of uh, ontological regimes uh, uh, in the same geographical space. Uh, Southeast Asia is a good example for that. Uh, if we take the the, the concept, uh, Scott's concept of the Zomia, uh, of the heel tribe uh, cosmology as Harem calls it, we are in most cases in, in a typical uh, uh, animist regime in general. But since these uh, uh, polities, these hill tribes, if you wish, or the upriver, downriver, etc., uh, are also uh, in contact and they've been in contact for a long time with uh, analogous regimes with uh, states, uh, uh, kingdoms, etc., etc. Uh, which are very, uh, usually very typical uh, analogous uh, features. Uh, they have developed uh, uh, a form of interesting hybridity uh, between, uh, uh, which can be historically, uh, uh, and has begun to be historically studied. Uh, there are other cases like that, cases uh, in, uh, for instance, in uh, northern uh, South America, at the, at the interface between the Andes and the lowland societies, there are cases very similar uh, to that, um, uh, which are very interesting to study. Others are more difficult to uh, understand. I have attempted in one of my last books, uh, 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 The Forms of the Visible, which is a book about uh, the uh, the uh, iconic regimes that correspond to the different forms of uh, worlding uh, to describe a, a form of hybridity, which is uh, uh, that of the Tsimshan uh, uh, group in uh, on the Pacific coast of Canada at the, the border with Alaska, uh, so-called uh, north, Northwest group of uh, uh, no, northern North America, and uh, the 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 Tsimshan are interesting in the sense that their images reflect the, the duality of the production of images with two regimes. One is obviously uh, animist, and the other is obviously totemist, uh, and they and they refer to different aspects in their culture where the both elements are combined. Um, uh, in particular, uh, these aspect, these these images, in fact, depict the same things. Most often, they are animal spirits, but animal spirits who are taken in very different senses, uh, meanings, in the sense that some of them are animal spirits that have been inherited within a house and uh, which have transmitted their qualities to the inhabitants or at least to some uh, uh, lines within the house um, 
and uh, uh, they tend them to conflate the humans and the non-humans within a group of properties, uh, both physical and moral, that is very much uh, similar to what we see in Australia. And at the same time, there are other forms of relationship with uh, animal spirits, which are very individual, acquired through one's uh, lifetime, and which are uh, depicted, uh, uh, they are the same animals again, but they are depicted in, uh, according to entirely different conventions. Um, so this is, uh, I think, a good example of a structural hybridity that works well. And studying these forms of structural hybridity would be interesting to introduce more uh, uh, both refinement and diversity in the in the in the combinations that uh, these four uh, uh, these four four type uh, uh, models uh, uh, allow. Now, regarding commodity, it seems to me that commodity is the product of naturalism. The idea that non-humans are objects, uh, humans are subjects. Uh, Non-human are objects that can be uh, taken as resources and uh, transformed into a uh, possibility of making profit through the Marxist uh, substitution, uh, famous substitution of uh, 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 money, good money, uh, by contrast with um, good money, good. Uh, uh, so in this in this respect, uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, the initial one, at least one of the conditions for uh, capitalism, is naturalism. That is the exteriority of resources of non-human resources uh, as something that can be appropriated individually or collectively and transformed into into uh, into uh, riches. Uh, into wealth, uh, and it's also linked to uh, colonialism, which permitted uh, the uh, primitive accumulation uh, by uh, European countries with, in fact, little resources, like uh, Great Britain, uh, acquiring, uh, thanks to the, uh, the, 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 the appropriation of vast land resources, uh, in particular in the Americas, the conditions for accumulating wealth in such a way that it permitted uh, the uh, massive investment in capital that the Industrial Revolution uh, required. So, um, commodity, yes, is, by, it seems to me, a, a classical uh, uh, of uh, naturalism, which does not mean that when it is, once it is established, cannot uh, expand elsewhere. No, it means that the notion of commodity, then, uh, which is one of the interesting aspects or, and, 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 and terrible aspects at the same time of capitalism, that uh, uh, the, the perversiveness of the, uh, the mechanisms which uh, allow the diffusion of capitalism, as well as the perversiveness of the mechanisms that are low allow the, the diffusion of science. Uh, the, 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 the naturalism was the, uh, the uh, initial condition for the development of uh, modern sciences, no? uh, experimental sciences in the 17th century. But once the actual procedure of these sciences were established, these procedures could travel, and so uh, 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 they could uh, uh, establish themselves in parts of the world where the uh, ontological regime was somewhat different. Uh, and uh, in fact, I, 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 I uh, you can be a, a, a Chinese a, a atomic scientist. Uh, uh, with the uh, respecting the cult of the ancestors and uh, uh, interested in feng shui and uh, 
And uh, in fact, uh, with all the evidence of an analogist uh, 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 regime and be a, a highly efficient uh, 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 scientist by using the, the, the there's a dissociation uh, which is interesting, which makes, uh, makes history uh, such a complex science. Uh, there's a dissociation between the conditions of apparition of some uh, features and uh, and the fact that some of these features circulate uh, in uh, in uh, different ontological contexts. You no, know? so the same with uh, commodity. Uh, 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 I I I witnessed the emergence of commodity among the Achua. When when I arrived among the Achua, there was no commodity in the in the in the classical sense. The the society where there was no uh, money, and there was no uh, wage uh, wage uh, uh, system, uh, uh, and exchange was based on the fact that the same goods would circulate between people in order to reinforce the, uh, the, the links between them and not to uh, acquire uh, uh, something which was rare or coveted. Um, so, um, and uh, progressively, I uh, witnessed over the years, because I've been there for almost 50 years now, uh, how certain type of things uh, uh, are uh, thought of as producing money, and money that can be used to buy certain goods, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So commodity, uh, uh, commodity has appeared, but not commodity fetishism. Commodity fetishism is something which implies a full, full-fledged capitalist system. And this, I was made aware of that when I came back uh, from fieldwork after almost three years with. Uh, a very limited amount of goods, uh, uh, which I found uh, enough for the satisfaction of my basic needs. When I came back to France, I was uh, immersed in a world of commodities, no, uh, and I was uh, I was not uh, I, I'd become uh, uh, unfamiliarized with that, and it was very harsh, uh, I must say. Uh, even to to behave as a as a normal consumer, no. What, what, what do I choose between all this huge offer of of things, uh, which most of them are not necessary to my uh, satisfying my needs, no. Uh, so uh, yes, it requires a uh, and commodity fetishism in the sense of Marx, in the sense that uh, although I'd read Marx before going to the field. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, uh, commodity fetishism did not strike me uh, uh, as much as when I came back and when I saw that most interpersonal relations were mediated by uh, commodities, uh, which uh, is, 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 uh, is, uh, is a terrible, uh, 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 well, Fieldwork, in a way, is, has a, this positive aspect that it makes it renders what you've read before uh, uh, obvious. Uh, so, Marx' analysis on commodity fetishism became absolutely uh, obvious for me when I came back, and I, I, I saw what it meant uh, to live in a capitalist system after having lived in a non a non uh, uh, American Art Society for a number of years. <laughs> Any more questions, please? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for, for the talk. Uh, I have um, actually one question about uh, the last part when you mentioned the, the verticality of uh, supervision 
animism. And uh, I don't know if my, perhaps I don't remember correctly, but I'm not sure that it was point out, pointed out in the Beyond Earth and uh, Culture and Nature book, or it was something that uh, come after. And uh, so about that, I have two, uh, uh, two kind of questions. So it seems to me that here you know, the idea was that um, vertical uh, animism was a specificity uh, in your understanding of uh, Sufasian animism in contrast to the, I would say, uh, North American or South American kind of egalitarian animism. And uh, you mentioned um, that uh, this kind of animism, that first you mentioned in, in terms of North American and South American animism that uh, it was a kind of in resistance to analogism and maybe in reference to you know, class resistance, I mean society resisting to the implementation of the state. And uh, when you were speaking about uh, Sufasian verticality, uh, you, you were mentioning that a kind of, by a kind of gradual transformation, we can go to uh, analogism. So here I have two, two, two questions about that. Uh, I mean, I'm not an uh, anthropologist, but I was wondering in terms of methodology, uh, can, how can we be sure that vertical uh, animism in Sufasia is a genuine feature of this animism or is already a contamination from neighboring uh, states uh, for a long, long time uh, that have been much more present in these regions than, for example, in North America? Uh, so just just first question. So the question is in terms of uh, um, the shift from an anthology to another one, uh, for you this shift is a kind of, uh, is more following a kind of a Cuvier model or more kind of, more kind of Lamarckian model. What I mean is that is it more following a kind of Cuvier model of catastrophe and radical shift? Uh, for example, because in one way you resist and the it comes against you, and in another way you, it's already kind of included some of your features, even if it's not developed to its most. So is the shift from an analogy to another, uh, ontology from another, is kind of you know. La Cuvier model of you know radical shift or Lamarckian model of uh, gradual variations. Uh, when I uh, began working on the idea of animism, my uh, reference, my references for uh, beyond uh, 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 the Americas were mainly uh, 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 ethnographies where uh, it was obvious that there was a high degree of similarity be between what I had observed or read uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Americas and the, and the local uh, uh, setting. Uh, I, I referred to uh, uh, the Shewong in Malaysia, for instance, uh, which uh, um, uh, have been described in the monography by Signe Howell, and uh, it's very striking to see how the Shewong uh, are, in many cases, they could be, in, in, in many respects, they could be transposed or transported to Amazonia. So similar uh, 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 things. And uh, the Orongasli, the Aboriginal people of, of Malaysia in general, uh, are, have features that are very close to uh, what uh, uh, I had uh, read. And of course, my attention was attracted by that because of the similarities. Uh, and I, be I began to be interested in the complexity of uh, uh, Southeast Asian animism by reading more extensively on other uh, parts of uh, Southeast Asia where I was, um, uh, why well, I, I noticed that the, there were similarities and differences also. So the question is whether whether it's uh, whether it's uh, genuine or it, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, an influence of the surrounding uh, uh, environment. What I find interesting, and this is why I mentioned uh, 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 Scott uh, Zomia, is that. There is obviously some kind of interface between the uh, island tribes or the uh, classical uh, uh, animism in Southeast Asia and the, the surrounding 
uh, 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 analogous state regimes. And probably this is a case where clusters ana analysis is is uh, is is uh, can be applied. I I I I I've, I've objected to uh, uh, cluster analysis uh, as because I I find uh, uh, unrealistic that a society would develop uh, as a, a reaction to something which does not exist yet. No, so the. Uh, uh, the, the, and also the, the idea that the society exists as a sort of transcendental uh, subject, uh, which in Amazonia, of course, is 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 quite irrealistic. No, there would be society as a sort of common will and general will of people to resist to the imposition of something. So this can be. This can be uh, achieved in certain historical circumstances. So there, there are societies um, that live at the foot of the Andes, and uh, and uh, are and have been aware for a long number of centuries of the existence of states uh, of social formations that are very different from their own in the Andes, and uh, uh, that have resisted uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the, all attempts at colonization and conquest for uh, many centuries. But this is a, a specific case that exists in specific historical circumstances. It's not the savages in class uh, sense that resist as such uh, the imposition of something which has not yet come, not it, uh, which I found uh, objectionable. Uh, so the case of the Societies at the foot of the Andes and uh, uh, who, have, who have developed a, a strong rejection of the state formations in the Andes, uh, on the one hand, and uh, uh, the 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 sort of interface between state formations and uh, egalitarian societies in the in Southeast Asia are good examples of uh, 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 of the reinforcement, both the hybridization forms of hybridization, hybridization and reinforcement of specific features uh, by contrast with the neighbors. No, what uh, um, what could be uh, which is which is something which has been observed by anthropologists everywhere, um, uh, and which the uh, Gregory Bateson has called. Uh, uh, schismos genesis, no, the, the reinforcement of a pattern of behavior by contrast with a, with with a, with a neighboring or a partner uh, 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 nearby. Um, so uh, uh, when you when you yeah, when you speak of of contacts, you have to take into account both aspects. One aspect is the diffusion of certain ideas and and pattern of behavior, and on uh, and also the reaction to the pattern of behavior that you observe among your neighbors and uh, which you dislike and do not want to emulate and to which your own form of uh, uh, organization is is a, is a is a reaction to to um, the question of um, i think the the question of change um I, I, I mentioned briefly the one pattern of change, which is the fact that um, uh, within an ontological system, a certain kind of relation becomes uh, uh, changes and transformed into another kind of relation that does not fit anymore with the ontological pattern. Um, this can be when when I when I mention cases of highly uh, 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 hierarchical uh, animism that verge on uh, analogism like the Toraja, I think this is a case where precisely uh, 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 graded 
souls descend hierarchy and the, the fact that uh, it, I, I may return to the question of tribe species. Uh, I, I use the word tribe species because I think that uh, basic to the form of how people conceptualize their social organization are uh, uh, ontological features. Uh, and so the, the, the classical way in which uh, the social world is conceived of in Amazonia, for instance, is that each different group of beings with the same body will share a, 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 an interiority and subjective experiences of in, intercommunication uh, differ from one another because of their bodies, no? And as such, there are as many societies as there are different types of bodies. There are different types of human bodies, and the difference is not is is in the sense that they are uh, these human bodies are differentiated by the way they are dressed, by the hairstyle, by the weapons, by the ornaments, by the languages, etc., which are considered. I speak of tribe species because of that, uh, in, in a way, uh, every uh, tribal group is conceived as a different species. Uh, there is no co general concept of humanity, if you wish, no? Uh, and so, um, this diversification of tribe species, both within the human uh, humanity, humankind, and, bit, of course, in, in the in the among the uh, plants and animals uh, is is replaced uh, in highly hierarchical uh, 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 social uh, polities like the toraja by different kinds uh, that is the there are, there are different groups within what we call society that have different uh, that uh, that are of a different kind because their bodies are different. Their bodies are not of the same kind. While by contrast, in, in standard animism, all the bodies of a group of humans that share certain what we call cultural features, but would be best defined as natural features. You no, know, that again ornaments, habitat, uh, way of of feeding, etc., uh, are considered. Uh, to unify them in 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 social polities like the the, the Toraja, the the the, uh, the the different groups that conform the social polity are, are are physically different. There are different kinds, no uh, 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 natural kinds, if you wish. And so uh, there is this this combined with uh, an, an an amplification of hierarchy applied to these differences in kinds uh, is a good step for uh, a transformation into an analogous system. But it, this is a very gradual process, no? Uh, one uh, should, uh, uh, I, I, um, I'm interested in people trying to uh, use, and this is why I, I was interested by the by the volume edited by uh, Guido Sprenger and uh, Guy Arem, when people use the, the categories I've, I've put forth in order to understand specific situations, no? Uh, in that case, uh, uh, Southeast Asia is a very good uh, place to understand these forms of transition. But they are gradual, they are gradual, and the problem is that in many cases, uh, we don't have a very large, uh, Time death, uh, which would allow us to understand uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the evolution, the transformations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no, so um, uh, the the historical approach is basic yeah, to understand these processes. No, there are also some questions from online participants. Uh, 
in your view of animism, is there any intrinsic difference between human animal relationship and human plants relationship? If yes, how do you how do you explain it? If not, what are the reasons? <laughs> That's a tricky question. Uh, I would say that uh, probably, but, but the 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 alter by default is the animal, uh, or the animals rather. The 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 animal as as a as we understand it uh, in the West is not a category that is uh, relevant in animal system. The animal is a capital A, no. Uh, so the, uh, different forms of animal lives are really the the. Uh, this is where you can. Uh, this is. The, the, there are stories in the whole animist world, of unions between male humans and female animals. Uh, and these stories are based on the fact that, as I said, that in fact, uh, uh, bodies are clothing. And so within the clothing, um, the, 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 there, is, there is a subjectivity. And when you see an animal, in some cases, you can see beyond the physical disposition of this animal and see the human-like interiority and then entertain a relationship with this human-like interiority. And so there's, uh, uh, there's a famous story which is common uh, in northern North America and in part of Asia of the, uh, of the union uh, with a, a, a she-fox. Uh, there's a very good uh, uh, story uh, among the Inuit. No, it's a, it's a man who uh, goes out uh, hunting, and when he comes back, he sees that his food has been cooked. So he wonders what happened. No, and so um, uh, he, he goes out hunting the next day, and the same thing happens. And when he on the third day decides to hunt to uh, to hide. And uh, he sees a female fox approaching his uh, uh, dwelling and uh, 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 taking off uh, uh, fox clothes and becoming a woman. And so uh, what he does, he, he, he grabs the, 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 the clothes and says, uh, I won't give you back the clothes if you do not accept to live with me. And so they live together, and then after a while, she goes away. These kinds of stories, I've heard them also among the Achua, not with fox, but with other uh, animal otters, for instance, no? Uh, and they, 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 they are based on the idea that the, 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 the alter ego, in, in, in most cases, uh, is, is, the, is the animal. Uh, plants... Have, have, have a derived status in a way from, I think, from this initial uh, uh, confrontation of subject to subject. It doesn't mean that the plant are not subjects also. Uh, one of the first uh, inkling of the what animism was during my fieldwork was the, the, the Achua spent long time in the morning before sunrise discussing the, their dreams, no? And, uh, one woman was explaining that she had a dream where a young uh, girl came to visit her to tell her that she was being poisoned and that she took the uh, this woman uh, responsible for this poisoning. And the story was that this uh, young uh, girl was a manioc plant uh, that had been planted very close to a group of plants that are used for poisoning fish and which are uh, uh, very uh, 
venomous. Um, and so she was complaining that she was suffering from the proximity of this, but she appeared as a young girl. And so the, 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 the so the, the general idea in uh, standard animism, let's say, is that non-humans see themselves as human. And I see, since they see themselves as human, they appear, of course, to humans as humans. Uh, um, and this is the case, of course, with animals, and it's the case also with plants. But I, I would say that plants uh, uh, derive uh, uh, their positions from the position of animals. Uh, uh, they do not have an equal status uh, uh, from that uh, of uh, animals. And there are interesting cases in, precisely in Southeast Asian animism uh, by contrast with um, Amazonian animism, for instance, where each plant is a subject and you have to treat with each plant individually and each plant will come and see you as um, in this anecdote uh, and uh, establish a contact with you um, in, in the in uh, southeast asian animism there is a tendency for certain plants in particular for rice to become hypostasis that is to become a general kind uh, independently of each uh, uh, of each uh, a plant, um, and so when uh, the uh, when you, for instance, when a, a natural woman in her garden sings to her plants, she sings to her plants individually to such a, a manioc plant to such. A, a uh, yam plant, such a sweet potato plant, etc. By contrast, in many parts of Southeast Asia, re regarding, for instance, the the, the rice, there is a, the the a soul of the rice, and it's a general soul <coughs> for all the, the 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 rice plants, and the soul of the rice has to be uh, placated, attracted in the in the in the Sweden. Uh, this is why uh, small huts are constructed in the Sweden to attract the soul of the rice. So the, 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 there is a, a collectivization of plants, uh, which is not as, uh, which is not common, which is not, which is unheard of. Uh, because collective plants in, uh, in uh, Amazonian animism are, are, are not subjects anymore, no? For instance, the, the Atua said that grass, grass has no soul because it's a collective. Uh, fish that go in shoals, for instance, have no soul because they are they are collectives. No, so it's the, the, this process of individualization is very important, and it's perhaps easier uh, to um, to do with animals uh, than with plants. Um, Except with large trees. Large trees are, have a very individual soul. <laughs> Sorry, last two, we collect last two questions, okay? Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, can I ask my question in French? Yeah. Bonjour, Monsieur Descola. J'ai une question. C'est qu'en lisant votre livre, Les Lances du Crépuscule, j'ai l'impression qu'à plusieurs endroits, vous attirez l'attention sur ce que vous appelez l'heureuse amnésie du peuple Hachoua, c'est-à-dire, enfin, si je simplifie les choses énormément, c'est-à-dire qu'ils s'intéressent très peu à ce qui concerne l'origine, enfin, l'origine de presque tous les êtres. Et je serais curieuse de savoir comment euh, ce phénomène en particulier s'accorde avec les quatre euh, principaux modes d'identification que vous nous présentiez. Euh, Penseriez-vous qu'il qu s'agisse d'une conséquence logique et nécessaire de l'animisme Merci. Si <rire> entendu. 
。Discola 教授就是他的《黄昏之矛》这本书里头，他在不同的地方有的时候强调，就是呃，阿舒瓦人呃的文化里头有一个现象，就是他们好像活在一种快乐的健忘里面，意思就是说他们对于发生在呃远古的事，或者说他们对于事物的 origin 好像没有太大的兴趣。那我就是很好奇，想要问 d i s c o l a 教授，就是这样的一个独特的现象，怎么跟他今天跟我们介绍的四四大理论，呃，怎么呼应？呃，我我就是我比较具体的请教他，觉不觉得这样的现象是 animism 的一个逻辑必然的结果？这样，嗯。Okay, I have two questions, and they are uh, related. Uh, first, I want to go back to the question of change or transformation. You have said that these four ontologies are not exclusive, but one tend to be dominant. Uh, yes, <laughs> you have said that these four ontologies are not exclusive, and one tend to be dominant in certain society or culture. But um, so do you see the possibility of uh, one ontology being replaced as the dominant one uh, in a society, for example, from animism to naturalism? Have you seen this uh, happening? And I'm asking this because um, when you talk about animism in Southeast Asia, um, from standard animism to those more hierarchical animism. It's re related to social stratification. But um, that book didn't talk about the influence of world religions in Southeast Asia, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam has long history of influence in this region. And I think um, when we talk about animism, we cannot dis regard the influence of world religions in Southeast Asia. And also like I'm stand, I'm starting a group in the Philippines. They are egalitarian, very standard enemies. Uh, it's the Ilongot or Bukalot. And now they are um, going through the process of Christianization and happened for several decades already. And do you see the possibility of them Becoming Christians and becoming more naturalist. Two very interesting questions. <laughs> um, I uh, think that to each mode of worlding or to each mode of identification, there corresponds a regime of temporality or a regime of organization of duration, let's say. And uh, the, uh, it's uh, if Providence uh, would grant me uh, many more years of life, uh, I would be interested in developing this aspect. Uh, I, I, it's obvious that uh, in uh, the animist regime of temporality is one which flattens duration. Uh, when I said that uh, so much where people did not remember the name of their grandparents, uh, it's because there is no time death in the sense that the world of mythology, that is the world, the world that is related in myth, uh, uh, is, 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 a, is a world that is not it is not very far. It's 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 a world, and that it's a world which is still present in many respects, since beings uh, that appear in myth are still present. No uh, 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 spirits and things like that. No, um, and so uh, there can be no uh, uh, what, what Lewis told. He was much criticized for that. Uh, but when Levi Strauss said they, 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 is, they are cold and hot societies, I think is, he was very right. They are, they are societies that uh, renders the uh, accumulation of events and the role of this accumulation of events in social life uh, uh, null 
by ritual, that is by trying to subvert the historicity of events, no? Uh, these are called societies, and they're societies who are organize themselves and conceive of themselves and their projection uh, in the future by reference to the past. And these societies are hot societies, and this is these are by definition uh, uh, societies um, that are not necessarily exclusively uh, Western societies, but where uh, the, the 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 past and the accumulation of features from the past, conventions, people, uh, goods, etc. Plays a very important role in the, in in the in the in the present. This is not the case at all uh, in uh, in uh, animism. And uh, so the, the the question of hierarchical animism, what uh, Kai Arem calls hierarchical animism, uh, it, it implies a transformation in the way uh, uh, time is conceived. No. The, the time becomes cumulative. Uh, the, 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 this reference I made to this woman who could uh, remember uh, more than 50 of her ancestors uh, is something that is uh, that, that, that points to the fact that the accumulation of ancestors plays a part in the present. Uh, so there is a large difference here, and the, and, the, and it's a symptom of a transformation, of a deep transformation of, of animism. I I, I agree. Um, in in the, what what is uh, characteristics of uh, of uh, analogism to me is the cyclical nature of time, uh, which. Uh, uh, which Mircea, Mirza Eliad wrote a book on this, uh, which he present he opposed the uh, the uh, cumulative time and the arrow of time of uh, of the West with uh, non-modern societies that have uh, a cyclical uh, 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 conceptions of time. I think he, he overstated uh, the thing in the sense that. It's only uh, the uh, analogist uh, uh, polities that have this conception of, uh, of, of uh, cyclical time. Um, um, but what I want to give up further, uh, especially since I've, uh, I've talked a lot, but I think, yes, there are different regimes of temporality. And when I think that when I, th I talked of the happy amnesia, uh, it's 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 a reference to uh, the the weight that we have on our shoulders in the West or in ancestor societies, where the ancestors, or at least not, we don't have in the West real ancestors in the sense that they are ancestors in China, for instance, but we have forebears and they are at times a, a bit heavy on our shoulders also. So we 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 feel the dependence. Uh, to them in, in a way uh, that uh, people like the Atua do not feel because they 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 uh, they live their their lives independently of what their forebears did, and this is something very surprising and refreshing in a way. <laughs> um, now the question of of, of the of the the role of religions. Um, I mean, religions is a very different, is a very, is a very large term uh, um, uh, to define the different types of ideologies that each one of them conveys. Um, I think that most of the religions you mentioned uh, are analogous in the general sense. So they can combine in one way or another with uh, local uh, uh, ontologies, except for a sort of 
variation of Christianism, which uh, has been fostered by evangelical groups, by um, uh, with a short, uh, with with a with a strong uh, emphasis on uh, individualism uh, and the necessity to acquire goods and achieve before the uh, otherworldly uh, life to achieve uh, um, uh, wealth consideration etc at the local level and the historical level while on earth uh, this is i think a uh, development of protestantism uh, which has been well studied uh, I, I don't have to refer to Max Weber to uh, point that out, um, which has taken a, a very extreme acute form in uh, evangelical movements and which in a, in a way contrasts with uh, analogous societies and, uh, and um, uh, in fact is an uh, a, a injection of a, of, a, of a metaphysical naturalism, let's say, uh, to uh, uh, local traditions. So, uh, hybridization with, with, the develop, with globalization, uh, hybridization has become uh, the most common form of hybridization is with naturalism, of course. So, all the forms of naturalism that we observe now, including these forms of religious naturalism, let's say, uh, 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 have, have effects you no know, in uh, transforming uh, local ontologies into something different and 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 um, in processes of hybridization uh, that take very very different forms you no know? um, so yes it's uh, uh, but one could not talk of hybridization in general and there's a difference between the, the form of uh, I was at the National Palace Museum yesterday uh, looking at the at the paintings of Giuseppe Castiglione was one of the Jesuits at the Imperial Court of China who after having uh, tried to teach uh, artificial perspective to a Chinese artist uh, finally decided to paint himself following the uh, Chinese tradition, no? And becoming thus a very highly esteemed uh, uh, Chinese artist, no? So this form of Christianity uh, was uh, compatible in many respects uh, with, uh, with uh, Chinese analogism, uh, while uh, uh, Pentecostal uh, movements, for instance, uh, less compatible because they accentuate the uh, the uh, dimension of uh, of Christianity, which was not very present among the Jesuits, which is the uh, the equality uh, and the individualism, which is present in the Paulinian uh, 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 teachings, no, uh, in, in Christianity very early on, but not emphasized by uh, by by Christians in in many contexts, but emphasized by the evangelical movements, yes. Uh,不好意思,我可以问一个问题吗?我放在那个chat uh, Oh,我在chatroom里头有写把问题打进去,我试试看英语系的梁一平。哦,在试训里面。是那个一平亮。Okay,这是,okay,是那个my oh, question on follow? 对对对对对,这是我的问题。I mean, there are two third questions. The first one are the four models interactive. 
to uh, second question can they use to explain the miracles in the bible uh, the third one are there any anthropologists in southeast asian who are engaged in similar studies that that's the question uh, yeah let's... Uh, well they are as i said the uh, uh models uh describe the phenomenological consequences of kinds of inferences that any one of us can do. So they are the stabi they are the formal stabilization of some kinds of inferences that any human can do. And uh, in that respect, uh, the the compatibility uh, is uh, based or the incompatibility is based on the fact that there are certain elements that uh, um, at a certain stage uh, uh, transform the system in such a way that there is a, 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 a leap to uh, another system. So this is the whole discussion about the uh, uh, animism and analogism that I uh, presented is precisely uh, 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 about this. No, at one time do we step from uh, hierarchical animism, if you wish, uh, and enter into uh, analogism? Um, this is a question which is both. Uh, 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 Theoretical, there are, there are theoretical conditions for that. Uh, when I mentioned, uh, for instance, the uh, the uh, the Torah job, uh, which I did uh, at length, you know, the fact that they are different within the collective different tribe species, we are here on the verge of something which is different in the sense that it's a multiplication of interiority and a multiplication of physicality, and we are entering there into something which is different from animism. So these kinds of uh, of of, of co combinations are uh, common. Uh, now, uh, if there are uh, anthropologists who are interested in this, yes, I mentioned these people uh, who edited uh, uh, the book. Guido Sprenger and Kai Arem uh, edited the, this book, and they uh, they, uh, they they this 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 book gather gathers a, a number of. Uh, of uh, articles by people who reason along these lines, yes. So there's a community of people who are interested in these ideas uh, uh, applied to Southeast Asian uh, uh, ethnography. Southeast Asia is, is an extraordinary uh, diverse uh, region where there are some things that are common, obviously, and others with many internal differences. And so it's a it's a group of transformation in the in the Levi Straussian sense, no, which is highly interesting in the sense that it is a a, 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 a set where elements are combined uh, or transform into one another in a logical way. But it's uh, what I found, uh, but it's new because I, I've been talking to. Uh, in France, in particular, to specialists of Southeast Asia, and they are all obsessed by the specificity of their own, my own tribe, in a way. No, so they, it's uh, and it's so different from any other uh, uh, tribal group elsewhere in Southeast Asia. While when you go at it from uh, an outside perspective, uh, like mine, the, the 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 unity of the of the region is very obvious. Mm. And here, and that give one thanks again to Professor Descola. And thank you for coming.